Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Happy Even After podcast. So I am here today with Dr. Lisa Ferrari and Dr. Carla Fry, who are clinical psychologists that have been teaming up as authors, creators, and entrepreneurs for over a decade. They're affectionately known as the Dr. F's. They are directors of a vibrant psychology clinic in Vancouver, and their team specializes in providing mental health treatment for all individuals, couples, and family members. They are the founders of an international community initiative called the Kindness Patrol, where they give kids creative opportunities to experience the joy of delivering kind deeds to others. Their most recent ebook called Splitting Up, How to Tell the Kids the Do's and Don'ts from the Dr. F's is hot off the presses. So welcome, ladies. Thank you, Renee. Hi there. All right. So let's talk about telling the kids because this is a question that comes up all of the time from my divorce clients and in the community of women that I serve. They want to know, how do you tell the kids about the divorce? Yeah, well, I'm really glad to hear that uh, parents are reaching out to you to ask and they're thinking about it and they're researching and they're reading about it. And, um, you know, one of the reasons we decided to put a uh, Uh, pen to paper or virtual space um, was we found ourselves over these last um, couple of decades saying very, very similar things and getting very, very similar questions ourselves. So we wanted to compile it and um, have all of our thoughts in one space. So Renee, like there isn't a wrong way to do it other than not preparing. There's a lot of right ways to do it. We're going to give you our, 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 our special go-tos um, as we talk today, but being mindful, prepared, and doing it with your partner, uh, as long as you do that, you're more likely to be uh, doing the right thing. Hmm. Is there a different strategy depending on how old your kids are? Yes, absolutely. I mean, the, um, the developmental age is really important. Young kids, I mean, if we're thinking about how to best prepare and how to best plan, um, you know, doing it the right way means the planning is a major piece in this. And you want to think about young kids needing um, less information delivered in less amount of time and making sure that there's very few distractions Um, and, and if the kids are different ages, because that's not uncommon, right? If you've got three kids at three different ages, it's okay to, um, have a more in-depth conversation with the kids that are a little bit older, right? So, um, there's a lot of overlap in what we share with kids uh, about divorce, but the older kids, uh, may have some questions and we tend to, uh, encourage in the planning a follow-up time, um, you know, 24 hours, 48 hours later, four questions, because sometimes kids are just kind of overwhelmed, right? If they've gotten the information and they weren't expecting it, and even if they've gotten the information and were expecting it, there's often still a lot of questions. Mm -hmm. And that's a good point, actually. Let me just throw that in there, because what we'd rather is for people to be thinking about this conversation and preparing to be able to um, know that there's going to be that second conversation and that third conversation and that fourth conversation. Everything of everything doesn't need to be squished into the first discussion. In fact, trying to to, um, figure out how many minutes and and the space that is going to be the most Um, uh, the the most comfortable, the best click for your child at their age is better than doing a a full download of everything, of everything, of everything. And this is including if your kid is 17, right? Getting getting very specific about uh, the script beforehand and uh, agreeing with your partner on what's said and what is not said. And, um, you know, really trying to orient that everything you do and say in into a child oriented, your kid, their personality, what they need, what matters to them. They might ask you questions about, are you going to get remarried or are, you know, you know, are, are you dating already or all certain manner of other things. And we'll get to how to uh, artfully not answer questions that are above a kid's pay grade, but really <laughs> they want to know what, what, 
how their lives are going to be impacted. And again, whether they're two years old or whatever their age are, that's really what we want um, parents to focus on is the kid centric perspective. So there was, there was a little bit of an add in, but it was kind of a long add in. So let's just break it down to the basics. Let's say that you have a couple uh, middle grade kids, like what does a script look like? What are the words that you actually use to tell them about the divorce? Mm Mm-hmm. You want to hit that, Dr. Ferrari? Yeah, sure. I mean, what we usually what we usually say to kids, um, school age kids, which, which isn't really that different than some of the older kids as well, is is that we want kids to know. We want parents to be able to tell kids that they love them very much, um, and that um, and that they made this decision together. And the decision is the decision that they've made together is going to is is. Um, is one where they have decided to now no longer be in a romantic loving relationship, but to be in a parenting partnership. And that, and that moving forward, their relationship with each other will be of a parenting partnership and they'll continue to parent them as they always have together. So we can't say we too many times. We talk a lot about we have decided. And this is very important to differentiate as we're talking about this, Renee, that it doesn't matter in this conversation whose idea it was uh, to um, uh, leave the marriage. This is not the time nor place for that. We have decided together, we will always be your parents. Um, I think people are pretty good now at, at saying very specifically to their kids, it's not your fault, but that doesn't mean we don't want you to say it. We still want you to say it. This is a, this is a parent thing. This is not because of anything you did or did not do or say. Um, and then we get into a whole list of things, depending on, on your family and your child about what's going to stay the same and what is going to change. So, you know, obviously some, some folks decide to nest wherein they share the space. Some folks decide to get a different space. Some folks decide to, to leave the family home and get two brand new. So what's going to, what's going to change and what's going to stay the same and the same list, Renee, um, it, it can never be too micro. Like literally for, for, for a four-year-old or a five-year-old, mm-hmm. I know you were asking about school age, but we'll, we'll give those examples too. It's like, you're going to have the same PJs to wear. You're going to have mm-hmm. your same stuffies. You're going to stay at the same school. You're going to walk the same um, uh, pathway to, to get to your classes. Very, very specific, same, same, same. Kids want to hear that. So what happens if you have one parent, though, who says, I didn't want the divorce, I'm not doing it, you tell the kids, because we see that happen a lot as well. How does that one parent approach it? Um, well, if it's they're- a tricky one. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, if they're consulting with us in our therapy room, I mean, it's there's a little bit of a therapeutic intervention that needs to take place, which must, which is a lot more difficult for a lawyer to do with their client. Um, But in terms of uh, helping parents to understand that um, the wanting to do it on your own and ensuring that they hear uh, that you didn't want the divorce, there's, there's not a real lot of like child centered thinking behind that. Anytime a parent, and this is really what we want parents to know, every time a parent feels strongly about sharing their own experience, it's often then fueled by more parent-centric needs, and it is also very adult-like information that doesn't benefit the kids whatsoever. It often helps the parent to feel better, but the kids tend to feel worse. So the intervention is helping parents, that parent in particular, get to a place where they understand you want to do what's best for your child. We're here to tell you that that approach isn't going to have the result that you are intending. The result that you're intending for yourself, you may achieve, but the result that you're intending for their well-being and their post-divorce adjustment will not occur. 
And we, we hear that from kids all the time. Kids may say they want to know because developmentally, they want to be able to like integrate that information and kind of know why this is happening. But at the end of the day, we've heard a lot of kids say, it, it doesn't make me feel good knowing that information. When they actually have it, it does not land well for them psychologically. So if you have a 17 year old or an 18 year old and they're asking questions and they want to know the why, and they're pushing for more details, how much can you actually tell them? Or should you not be telling them some things? Um, Because I think often parents think, well, they're older or even take this to like a 21 or 22 year old, they're older. So they have a right to know, like, do they have a right to know? Should they know? Yeah. The short answer is no. (laughs) Uh, the longer answer involves, um, you know, in, in general, when kids ask us things, whether they're younger or they are already uh, adults, um, they just because they ask it doesn't mean it's necessarily going to be good for them to hear it. And just because they ask it, we're not being bad parents if we say, look, you know, I know your brain is grinding around trying to figure this out. I know that you really want to know who started it or, 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 you know, what we have done to be able to salvage this uh, marriage before the breakup. But the thing of it is, is I really want to, if I was the parent, I really want to focus on you. We really want to focus on taking care of you. We really want to focus on how with this rift in, in the, in the parental relationship, how we can throw in together to do what needs doing for you. Of course, that was very verbose. You're not necessarily going to say that a 17 year old is going to give you about 30 seconds before he rolls (laughs) eyeballs at you. Right. But, but honestly, we want parents to have the permission to, to talk about the question. Like, I hear you, you really are grinding to, to figure this out, but this isn't the right time and space. And I need more time. And your other parent needs more time to figure out how to answer that for you. Now is not the time. So I'm sorry that this might be a frustrating thing for me to share with you, but legitimately we think it's the best answer for you at the minute. Do you have to know all of the details about the living situation in order to share this? Like if you're at the beginning stages and you don't know what a parenting plan is going to look like, should you hold off telling the kids until you know what the future is going to look like? Or do they just, you give them that, say, we're going to be doing this thing, knowing that you may actually not be physically separated for months or even longer. Well, I think that, you know, um, parenting plans and separation agreements take quite a bit of time for some that aren't getting along so well um, to, to, to get down on paper. So I think that, I think that if parents can, can get um, the essentials, right, as much of the essentials that they have control over and are able to put in their own parenting plan, even if it's not finalized, I think that if they can, if they can um, agree on some of the fundamental pieces, then it's the right time to share with the kids. But if, if they can't tell kids, you know, you know, whether or not they're going to be able to stay at the same school, they need to hold off. I mean, we need to have some, some information for them rather than, hey, we're getting divorced. And then to be continued with the details isn't going to be go well for the kids at all. Um, it'll, it'll be very anxiety uh, inducing for them. So I think that, I think it would be a good idea to get as many things, as many things that they have control over that they can share with the kids around what's going to stay the same, even if the living situation isn't fully solidified yet. Right. Yeah. You can have Renee, time it, with both of us. Totally. It's not a bad thing to say, I wish we had the answer for you about that. We're working on it. It, 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 it is absolutely okay. Uh, we really want to get that figured out. We don't have it figured out yet. As soon as we have it figured out, we'll let you know. And it's better to do that, that um, you know, in the, in the introductory place um, than the kids hearing it from their neighbor or from, you know, like, I mean, we, we talk about who needs to hear what first and how you share it with, 
your uh, your your best friends or or when do you share with uh, the teachers or the or or you know extended family? But you definitely want kids are kids they're sensitive. They know when something's shifting. It's much better to say something and to address that to than to do the like no it's fine um uh right. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I think regardless of whether or not the parenting plan is done, I've got parents that I consult with all the time where they're like, people are in the community are starting to figure it out. We need to get to the kids before they hear mm-hmm. that it's from others. So, so I think that there are some basic things that parents are able to say to their kids, which is we were, even if we're not sure what the living situation is going to be, you're going to have time with each of us. You're still going to, you're going to still have time equally with us whether that happens or not, but. Can we talk a little bit about, because everyone in the divorce space, making the decision to leave, to go, they, and if they have kids, they're always saying, well, I'm going to stay for the kids, or I want to do what's best for the kids. Do you have any insight into the actual impact of divorce on kids? Is there any thing that anything that you can say about, you know, what are the long term effects of divorce compared to maybe conflict, because that's kind of the way I talk about it divorce versus high conflict. And those are two different things. I'm really curious about your insight there. Hmm. Absolutely. Well, I mean, uh, the research across the board demonstrates that conflict is the number one negative mental health impact on kids of any age hands down. So I'm glad that you conceptualize it like that, Renee. Um, And so, you know, obviously conflict can occur if the two parties decide to stay in the marriage uh, and they could be miserable for 20 years um, with all kinds of conflict and negativity in the home. Um, You don't need to be divorced in order to have that you know, like, and, and people who bring that conflict into the separation and divorce. I mean, that's where we really spend a lot of our time helping folks to figure out how to do everything in their power to um, reduce that conflict. And, you know, like, it's, it's not obviously a binary discussion of stay together uh, and, and be unhappy or, or split up and, be happier or like, you know, it's obviously it's, it's more complicated than that, but, um, staying together primarily with somebody that you hate and you're in conflict with in order to quote unquote, be there for the kids, that is not going to be advantageous to your kids, mental health, to their social, emotional functioning, to their future ability to be in a positive, loving relationship. Absolutely. It, what's the impact of conflict? I'm curious, like in terms of, I mean, in growing up in a household where there's conflict, what, how does that impact them as adults? Well, we typically see in kids, the impact of parental conflict often raises a lot of anxiety and well, what we call is internalized behavioral problems and externalized behavioral problems. So anything from feeling very anxious um, and hypervigilant a lot of the time, um, being incredibly distracted by the conflict, not being able to focus in school. Um, and, and for some kids, not even wanting to separate from a parent to go to school. There's that separation anxiety when there's a lot of high conflict or they can identify one parent suffering more than the other and they want to take a more of a caretaking role. Um, low mood, depression is very, very prevalent with high conflict as well. And acting out behaviors for some kids as well, high risk behaviors, drugs, alcohol, um, just high risk um, behavior that um, that we would typically see, um, you know, with kids that have even experienced a trauma. Mm. So there is for some kids that we consult with, I mean, the divorce, um, the conflict of the divorce has had a traumatic impact on them very difficult for them to feel safe and secure in their own personal relationships as well. Yeah. And it tends to, you know, sort of um, pave the way 
for a young person to be either very passive in their relationships. Like I don't want to get yelled at. I don't want to cause a thing and therefore can end up in, in best friendships or relationships um, themselves, wherein they get taken advantage of, or the flip side, a little bit more like, okay, you know, like everything that happens in this friendship or in this relationship is a win or lose. So I better get in there like uh, with some aggression and like get my uh, point across. And so, I mean, again, it's not binary, but it tends to swing one way or the other in terms of their relationships and everything that Dr. Ferrari said about their mental health, a hundred percent, depending on yeah, their and, Right. And one thing that I want to add that, that tends to get really overlooked is the higher the conflict, the less safe it is for kids to get their own mental health needs met, where it's not a safe atmosphere and environment for them to uh, be seeking psychological services, even though parents are very supportive and want that for their kids. Um, it can be incredibly uncomfortable. It can feel incredibly threatening um, and unsafe because the conflict is so high. And if they were to really share how they were feeling um, about, about the family situation and the conflict, they, they would, they would, internalize it or have internalized it as, as really high risk stakes here that there's a potential that they could be in trouble or uh, they could make the conflict worse um, or that they um, they live it all day and would rather not even be in a situation where they have to open up to these emotions that they're dealing with. I have a lot of young clients that, you know, that have, that have needed to be in the therapeutic process for four years to actually talk about uh, the impact that the divorces had or to be able to talk about the feelings that they had at that time, even though the parents were very supportive in um, getting them the services. It's a barrier. Family conflict is a barrier for kids mm. to get mental health needs met. So let me ask about a situation. We see this all the time in the divorce world, and I'm sure you've seen it too, where one parent says to the other, um, don't tell your mom or don't tell your dad that we're doing this or that we had this conversation. They're asking the kids to keep a secret from the other parent. What impact does that have on kids? <laughs> yes. Well, wherever we can, when we get ahead of it, we um, try to provide the education um, that that is absolutely um, harmful to the child to have, um, you know, there, there shouldn't be secrets where the child has to hold that information. Um, what happens is kids feel guilty. They feel, they feel awful. They feel like they're being bad. They feel like they're being sneaky when they're sitting there, even if it's a small secret, uh, you know, don't, don't tell your other parent that we had donuts for breakfast or whatever, whatever it is, it, it, it interrupts that child's ability to connect with both parents and they feel awful. They, they, they they feel unsettled. They feel anxious. They, they wonder if they're doing the wrong thing because kids, you know, we generally teach them from when they're little people to, to tell the truth and um, to uh, care about the other person, you know, asking a child to keep something from their, their other parent, it interrupts that. It interrupts how they think about themselves as a good person or not. And it also interrupts their relationships. You probably have more to say about that, Lisa, as well. Yeah, I think, I mean, when we see kids throughout their childhood and into adulthood that have gone through divorce, you know, they're more articulate in adulthood when they say, remember when, you know, mom did this or remember, you know, and I'm like, oh yeah, I remember, uh, you know, I hated that, right? Like, you know, they're 20 something now and they're able to say mm -hmm. I it every time that happened. Kids don't like it. Parents need to stop. I think the parent who's doing it somehow secretly thinks that they're creating some kind of positive alliance with that child. Mm -hmm. We're here to tell you that we as psychologists have our eye on their relationship with their child. And we're here to tell you that you're doing more damage than actually um, that, th than actually um, that connection that you feel because you have this secret with your child. We're here to protect your relationship and all the kids are going to take away from that kind of behavior is the fact that they feel unsettled and 
uh, they feel anxious about it. They've got information that they don't want to keep from another parent. And as they grow and evolve, their takeaway is going to be, um, you know, it's going to be a judgment towards the parent that actually mm. pulled them into the lie. And parents need to understand that. And that's often an intervention that we use is, hey, we're here to protect your relationship with your child. These are the sorts of things that are actually going to backfire on you than have any kind of negative impact or positive impact that you're thinking it's going to have between you and your child or negative impact between you and your child and the, between your child and the other parent. That's fascinating to me because we do see this a lot where you have one parent who thinks like they're going to get their, this child to align with them. They're going to get to be their buddy. They're going to get to be the cool parent. And so they let these secrets sort of fester and tell the other parent to, to keep it from the, uh, the other person. And that's so interesting to me because the impact is not, is it is the exact opposite of what their intention is. And they're like driving a wedge into their relationship. Do you have any, Mm -hmm. like, why does that happen? It helps the parent. This is, this goes back to the, the motivation where it's very parent centric. It helps the parent to feel like they have control in a situation. It helps the parent feeling like they've got this strong alliance with that child. And the parent has some underlying anger towards the other parent. And this is, this is a way to passive aggressively, you know, uh, lash out. Yeah. And what happens with that favored parent business is that subtly over time, or sometimes not so subtly, depending on the family that we're talking about, is that, you know, the messaging is, is that the other parent is bad. The other parent is wrong. The other parent doesn't deserve love. The other parent is somehow a negative force. And of course, whether whether a child is um, a biological child of the two folks or is an adopted uh, child or otherwise, they still conceptualize themselves as part of these two people. And if half of them is bad, over time, that is going to erode in how they feel about themselves and their own sense of self and self-esteem. So it's, it's, it has a negative impact on the parent who's doing it on, it has a mm-hmm. negative impact on the child and, and, and also on uh, the child's relationship with the other parent. So yeah, full, full swoop. We don't like it. yeah we don't like it either so (laughs) what about parents who feel like they want they do we see it all the time interrogate their child when they come back from their parenting time with the other parent and they're peppering them with questions and they want to ask and they're really not inquisitive saying like did you have a great weekend but they're really digging to pull out details of everything that other parent did that was wrong what are your thoughts on that well, I think it still is in line with you keep interrogating your kids and it's going to affect your relationship with your kids. What do you want here, right? Kids have told us firsthand, this is like the number one thing on their list. They hate the questions. And we are very, very clear with parents that they have to stop. The types of questions that we're more interested in are the open-ended ones. Tell me something that you, you know, that put a smile on your face, you know, when you, you know, when you had time um, with your mom, right? Or, or is there anything that you want to share from the visit? You know, I'm always open and interested in hearing, Um, you know, more open-ended, leaving it up to the kids to share. Um, But these interrogations, and that's what we call them, you know, in our book, they are interrogations and kids are uncomfortable and they are left feeling is though a they've done something wrong because now they're sharing information that could potentially get the other parent in trouble, but also that the parent is planting a seed with that child that the other parent isn't capable, right? Like yeah. a, a lot of these, a lot, a lot of these questions that the parent that the other parents are doing something wrong or that they're not capable, and that does also does not land well with kids. It's mm-hmm. very Absolutely, and because this is who- somebody who they trust. Yep. And kids who get the, did you eat vegetables at your other parent's place? And what time did you go to bed? And did you do your homework? Did, did your other parent, they, they 
they tend to close down over time with that interrogating uh, parent. So that, you know, that question, 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 question business, because it feels so uncomfortable and so emotionally unsafe, leads to uh, a child who goes, "Mm, mm, mm." (laughs) and that's what you get that that those are the seeds that get planted. Yeah. Yeah. You know, 16 and 17 year old boys do that too. They grind. <laughs> Guaranteed, 100%. <laughs> You're just going to get a whole lot more of it. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. So, uh, what is the best way to support your children if you're going through a divorce? All right. Yeah, um, it's a big question. It's a big question. Work on your stuff, your own individual stuff. Work on, work on your grief work on your self-care, develop, develop a crew around you that doesn't just want to diss your ex, that wants to support you, that wants to support your, uh, your co-parenting, that wants to support your, your future. Honestly, there's so many things, but um, yeah. work on continue, your own. Stuff. Yeah. And continue to be a parent. Don't, don't, don't take five steps back because you need to be the favored parent maintain your parenting values. If, if certain rules and boundaries and expectations are, are, you know, if you believe in those things, just because the other parent's doing them differently, doesn't mean that you can't honor what you value as a parent because you're hyper-focused on wanting to compete with the other parent. Just get really or, or fix. In your own philosophy. Or fix right. what you think that the other parent is not doing or whatever. Mm-hmm. Or overcompensating because you feel guilty that mm. situation. So you tend to, you know, um, be a little bit more lenient with consequences and et cetera. But they need, they need their parents. You need to still be able to continue to parent. And both of those are, there's so many gr- million dollar answers um, that both of you just dropped here. But I love, I love the thought of like working on yourself, because if you're the happiest version that you are, you show up as a better parent, you show up as a better everything to the world. And, and you're not stuck in that anger. And you're not Mm -hmm. stuck in the blame game and looking at your ex as like that person being the, the, the root of all of your misery. And you don't do that. And when you're not doing that, you're a happier person and happier mom or dad. So I think that that that's so important. So let's talk about your book. Um, It is called splitting up how to tell the kids the do's and don'ts from the Dr. F's what inspired you to write it? Well, um, you know, we have an entire e-course where we go through the, 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 the start, the middle, the, the finish, but we wanted this little ebook to be able to be available um, uh, uh, quickly at people's fingertips. And it, and it really addresses something that we're asked so frequently. What do we say? How do we say it? What do we not say? And we wanted it to, just to be deliverable in one nice uh, little package. Some people don't want to uh, consult with uh, psychologists, don't have the finances to go ahead and get, um, uh, you know, consultation about this, or or maybe their legal counsel doesn't really exactly know how to direct them. So um, really to get that answered, it's not the everything, but it's a great place to start. And we want people to feel competent and um, that they can do this. Yeah. And you actually give scripts in this book. Like you give a the scripts of what people can take and the things that they can say to their kids, which I think is so important because that's a time when, when you're kind of at lost for words and you're looking for someone to guide you. So that resource is so good for that exact purpose. How do we find it? Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> Amazon rules the world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> All right. How do we connect with you? And um, are you open? Do you work with everyone? Do you have to be in Vancouver to work with you? Yes. Well, I'm, I mean, <laughs> legally, according to our college, we consult with folks in terms of our, our professional consultation within the province of British Columbia in Canada. 
Um, but we wanted to be able to have um, some of the information available, you know, via, via e-course and books and so on and so forth for people all around the world. But our Instagram is uh, clinically happy and it tends to um, at clinically happy. Uh, it tends to be um, uh, where we share information for people who cannot get to us uh, personally in our clinic. And we try to um, have as much good info on there to, for as many people as possible cross section. Yeah. And of course, I'll put all of the, the links in the show notes as well. Um, such a valuable resource. And I just love the, the way you approach it. I love your take on it. Um, and you guys are just, you know, spreading some, some light into the world in a place that's really dark for some people. So thank you. Thank you so much. So any final words for someone going through a divorce and thinking that it, they're just never going to see the light at the end of the tunnel? It's very possible. It's very possible to be happy. It's possible for your family to be happy. It is very, very possible that honestly, that the potential is truly there. And there's so many good resources out there. You just need to reach out and the support is there. Absolutely. Absolutely. To all of that. Find, find your tribe and and, you know, move forward, continue to take one step at a time. Thank you so much, Dr. F's for spending this time with us. Thanks, Thanks Renee. You.